live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE, covering Enterprise Connect 2019. Brought to you by Five9. Hello from Orlando, I'm Lisa Martin with Stu Miniman. We are in the Five9 booth at Enterprise Connect 2019. We're excited to welcome back to theCUBE one of our alumni, Jonathan Rosenberg, the CTO and head of AI at Five9. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining Stu and me on the program on day one of this big event. My absolute pleasure. I'm super excited to be here and super excited to talk about my favorite topic. So, love to be here. So this event is, has been around for a long time, 28, 29 years, evolving from PBX to VoiceCon Enterprise Connect. You've been to this event about the last 10 years or so. At least, yeah. Give us your perspective, and I know you're new at Five9, but your perspective on the evolution of not just the contact center, but customer experience and really um, this changing landscape of how enterprises and people want to communicate with each other. Yeah, well I mean it's been funny to sort of watch this through this technology evolution that manifests at the show and in the market. You know, for a long time it was about hardware, right? Big, hulky iron, and we used to have the petting, the hardware petting zoos, we call it. We'd have racks of equipment, you could go, ooh, look, there's blinky lights and cables, you know? And then it moved to software, uh, and we saw that here, and now we're deep into the software as a service, SaaS, cloud-based delivery models, and actually in a, in a bunch of ways we're coming to the tail end of that, into this AI era. And that's what's all the hotness, and you see tons of that. Almost everyone's put some kind of AI logo or branding on their stuff. And there's, there is some real meat to it, but, but that's sort of this interesting evolution, and, uh, and it's in its infancy in the contact center, and that's what's sort of exciting about it. Yeah, uh, so let's dig into that a little bit, because uh, as, as Lisa mentioned, uh, you've worked for a couple of the other companies uh, that have big booths uh, yep. here at the show. We've talked about intelligence back in the call center days. Oh yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, tell us what's different about the AI data at the center of everything is something that yeah. we definitely believe in. It's something that we hear all over the industry yeah. in the cloud shows and AI and everything. Yeah. But why is this so exciting? What really brought you to, to yeah. Five9 and gets, you, you've got a, a, a storied career, yeah, so yeah. You know, why, why, why here, why, why now? That? Because the technology is finally ready. I mean, technology is like speech recognition. I mean, we've been, the industry has been working on that for decades. And it was only in the last five years or so with the sort of creation of practical deep learning that the tech finally got good enough. And, and that was because of new algorithms, new data, you know, massive data sets, great hardware. Uh, that all made it possible. And so that sort of opened up the avenues. And that's why we're seeing products like Alexa and Siri take off is the, the tech has finally gotten good enough. Um, but what hasn't happened yet is it hasn't shown up in the workplace. And that's sort of what's really exciting to me is to take these technologies that have become so pervasive in the consumer world and use them to really reimagine how a lot of these enterprise products work. And that's why I came to Five9. Came to Five9 to do that. To do that for Five9, to do that for the industry. So you had a session this morning five surprising reasons why a business should move their contact center to the cloud. Yep. And we know cost is not the number one. Talk to us about some yeah. of those key imperatives that an enterprise in any industry right. really needs to be able to take advantage of by moving to cloud. Right, so a cost was a unsurprising reason. So what I did in my session was, I said, all right, five unsurprising, here's 10, here's 10 obvious reasons. So I went through those and cost is one of them. But on the what's surprising, um, there's a couple, the big one story really is that if you go to a true SaaS player, they have lots of customers. And they can actually aggregate data, software, capabilities across those customers and do things that are impossible on premise. So the two of them, for example, were better reliability. Often people are like, what? You know, I want to go to the cloud, I'm worried about reliability. Well, if you dig into it, you can see that once the technology has matured, the reliability can be much better than it is on premise because of the complexity that you can build. Same with security, often viewed as, wait, it's more secure on premise. Actually, if you go look at what you can do in the cloud, you can spend a lot more money on security and amortize that cost over multiple customers. And then of course there's AI, and that's about getting access to training data, but not just training data from one company, but using it across multiple companies to make the AI work better for everybody. So those were three of the big ones. 
Yeah, so when you talk about that kind of learning, uh, how do you make sure that there's proper firewalls? Is, you know, is yeah. five nine going to be able to say, okay, we can take care of everything, but wait, I don't know, my competitors on this, I don't want them getting advantage based on you know, what my companies yeah. have. How do you balance, uh, you know, there's uh, the security issues, there's you know, personal information issues, and there's yeah. you know, competitive dynamics, which you know, is, is a talking point oh, in the cloud these oh, days. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, so that's a, that's a paramount consideration to the design of this whole thing. So it starts with a basic level of like opt-in. Like we're just, you know, we can't do this and we can't use your data to train a model that's shared unless you want it. And generally it's a give and get. Like, oh, if you want access to the shared model, then you, you provide training data for it. If you don't, you can use a custom one, but it won't be as accurate. But then you don't share your data. It's your choice. So give the customer the option and give them something in return for their data. And of course, there's other parts of it like well, in most, you know, almost all the time, people aren't actually like looking at your data. It's used to train these models, ideally without human in the loop having to do that. Um, and so there's other there's privacy considerations baked in that it's um, that makes it feel that gives the customer comfort that they're they're able to do this. Well, that trust is critical, right? We talk yeah. about it, Stu and I do, and the queue at every show. But that's really essential because as we know as consumers, we're more and more and more empowered these days. Yeah. Whether we're transacting something yeah. through chat or video or Alexa, or we're checking on the status of a mortgage or something, we have so much information, but yeah. we also are very demanding. Yeah. I want to have this conversation with a business, regardless of the channel, and I want them to know what, I, what my issue is so that it can be addressed and resolved quickly, but I also want to make sure that what you're doing is not, you know, in the issue of privacy that we've all right. faced recently, that it's done in a way where this business can actually foster a trusted relationship with me as the customer. Yeah, yeah. so the trust goes on many levels, one of which, the most important to us, is our customers have to trust us. And that's, and the only thing that gives trust is time. You know, you have to be invested for a long time, and so we've really focused on building this long time customer trust with our reliability, with our high touch with our customers, and that gets us, that's really just what gives us permission to even start to do these things. The other thing too to touch on what you said is that end users contact the contact center. Um, that's one of the areas where actually there's already a user expectation that my call is being recorded, that what I say can be used for training purposes. So one of the reasons I, I got into contact center was that the privacy issues are much more readily addressed in the contact center space than other areas where you might be interested to apply this type of technology. I mean, we're talking about having AIs that are listening in on calls and analyzing what you say. If I were to do that for a regular phone call between me and my friend, like, people would be totally spooked. Like, there's no expectation that that happens. There is an expectation on the contact center. So that's the great place to build and grow these technologies. Yeah, I, I, I love that because, right, the, those of us that have you know, personal assistants at home, there's almost an expectation that they're living, listening in a little bit. Everybody's had the, oh wait, I was talking about that with someone, oh, yeah. not even on the phone, and all of a sudden I'm getting ads for that? Yeah. That's not right. So, question I have for you, you hired your first data scientist in the group, and one of the things we look at is, we now have this you know, great access to data. One of the biggest challenges is, okay, I can get the answers if I know the right questions to ask. What are some of the early areas that you're poking at? Any early use cases that you can share yeah. as to you know, where, where, we, where we see some Happy uh, to do some that. Good, good so one of the first things we're looking at is, is what I'm calling cross-customer analytics. So analytics is old news, everyone's had that for a while. Um, but what the cloud does is it gives a provider like us data across multiple customers. Now what we can't do is share one customer's data with another. That's a total, not, it's not what I'm talking about but aggregates are interesting. So for example, it'd be interesting to know, oh, this is my first call resolution rate, how does that compare to similarly sized contact centers in my geography, right? And that's something where we can produce an aggregate that has total anonymization, so no privacy issues, and it gives a customer this piece of insight that they have never, ever had before, never. And the only way you can do it with enough privacy is to have enough data to produce a useful aggregate and therefore it can only be done at the larger cloud contact centers and thus 5.9. As one of the market leaders, we are, we are having enough data to produce this kind of information. So this was an immediate, frankly, fairly low hanging piece of fruit we've started to dive into. No product announcements, it's just, just looking at data uh, to see what comes out and see if there's interesting meat there. 
but uh, it's a kind of insights I'm really excited about. No, I, I, I love that because people are always like, oh wait, I need to measure it, but sometimes numbers alone don't tell me anything. You got to put that into context for me, right? What are my peers? What, what are my industry? Exactly you know, right. What other stuff do I have there? Otherwise, you know, numbers are just numbers. Numbers are just numbers. You don't really know how you're doing. You're like a little island. Like you know how your contact center is doing, but is that good? You have no idea and we'll be able to unlock that over time, so very excited about that. Yep. Yeah, Red, sorry Stu, you guys have about five billion recorded customer conversations, so you can, I can think of the massive amount of competitive advantage that's in there, but you also brought up something that I hadn't considered before, and that is whether I'm you know, interacting with a business because I have an issue to resolve with my internet or something, and you're right, we do have this expectation that the, the call's going to be recorded, but I never think about it as this is actually something it's going to help me down the line, or the 50 other people that aren't calling in. So I, I thought your comment on privacy being kind of more advanced in the contact center was, was poignant, was very interesting, and not something that I was aware. Yeah, yeah. And it has to be, right? It ha yeah, exactly. There's, there's an expectation that this is what this conversation is about, and, um, and there's lots of tools in place for dealing with, uh, today already, with credit card numbers and phone numbers, which do get communicated between a user and the contact center agent, there's lots of you know, tech and precedent about how to redact and extract, and again, all in the contact center, nowhere else really does that technology exist, so. Yeah, so Jonathan, take us inside the life of the agent. So we know when we went from call center to contact center, uh, it really broadened the role a little bit. Uh, when I've got AI in there, is there new skill sets we need to have? You know, we always talk about, you know, if, if you're doing the same thing you were doing five years ago, <laughs> chances are you might need to be looking for a new job because they right. move so fast. So in the contact center, you know, what, what, what is the, the life of the agent likely to go through over the next couple yeah. of years? So this is an interesting debate and dilemma in the industry, and there's sort of two thought camps in this. One thought camp is the role of AI is to replace the agent. And this, frankly, is fairly traditional thinking. We use terms like deflection. Right? Like, we want to deflect the call from an agent. It means we don't want you to connect to a human being. Um, or containment, right? How successful were we at keeping the call in the IVR and the customer never got to an agent? Like, these are industry terms and, they were, and people view AI as like helping those things. There's a different camp of which you can tell I'm sort of in, which is like, no, 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 that's sort of the traditional way of thinking about it. And, and of course, we're going to have voice bots and IVRs, but really the question is, how do we deliver the best customer experience possible? That should actually be the guidepost. And what's funny is, in this industry, we know what the best customer experience is. It's that you pick up the phone, you call the contact center, you didn't wait one second, you went right to an agent, they were an expert, they knew exactly what to do, they fixed their problem in 20 seconds and you were done. That's the best experience. The problem is, is no one can afford to deliver that experience today. Well, that's where technology can help. So, and for, for me, the central question is how do we use AI to enable us to make it cost effective to deliver that experience all the time? And, and that does have an impact on the agents and it's going to be through assistance technologies that allow the agents to be guided in their interactions and allowing them to be experts quicker and to learn from the best experts in the contact center and change the way they think about training and access to data knowledge. It's going to be a pretty profound change but it never takes the human out of the loop. People, when, the, when you pick up the phone to call that contact center, it's because you actually want to talk to a person. And that human touch, that empathy, that you know, someone just to you know, vent at a little bit, that matters and we are nowhere, anywhere near having an AI provide that, if ever. So that's what's going to change. Humans and machines. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for stopping by theCUBE and oh, chatting with you and me about what's happening at Five9 Contact Center as a Service and the tremendous advantage that data can bring to organizations. My pleasure. Thank you, we guys. I want to thank you for watching theCUBE. I'm Lisa Martin with Stu Miniman on the program today, live from Orlando at Enterprise Connect 2019. Stu and I will be right back after a short break.